My name's Chuck Amanda, and I'm a uh, birch bark canoe builder. I'm Algonquin, I'm from the Algonquin Nation. Well, I, I learned as a young fella uh, with my grandparents. And a lot of people ask me, why did you, you learn from your parents? Uh, well, it skipped that generation because of residential schools. So I was one of the lucky ones that um, learned it off my grandparents because they, they're the ones I kept it alive for, from their generation. What I found is a lot of people, they would uh, praise my grandfather, but not realizing that my grandmother was half the business. So I got into doing baskets. And the reason why I did was I wanted to pay homage to her and then uh, have people remember her. About a year later, that's when I got into canoe making at the, re uh, at the uh, request of my grandfather. Well, I said, yeah, Gramps, but there's only one problem. I don't know where bar there's bark. And he said, and he went in the room and he did something and he came back out and he says, you, you go back to where you were harvesting root for your baskets. The following day we went back and lo and behold, I mean, I had been up and down this road about 12 times never seen this birch tree. And then I swear to God, out of nowhere, this birch tree appeared. And we took it back to my grandfather and uh, he gave me the green light. And then I, uh, I kind of reminded him, I says, well, do you remember all those years you thought I wasn't paying attention? Well, I was. And so that, and then that made me realize that uh, when we have kids, is even if they're 30, 40, 50 feet away, they're so still in tune with what we're saying. So we have to be careful what, what we say. Uh, it took a long time for me to hit that spiritual path. You know, I, I, I found it in my 20s. And then I went away from it and then I, 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 it came back to me. And so now um, the, the messages I get from, from the spirit world, uh, including my elders, uh, it's, uh, it's when we go out and we harvest from nature, it's always good to return something or put something back in, in place of what we took. So in this case, it was uh, tobacco. We take tobacco and then we thank Creator. We thank Mother Earth for the bounty that she gave us. And we ask that uh, everybody's safe and protected and nobody gets hurt. And then we'll ask the spirit of the tree to come live in the canoe because we're all connected uh, spiritually. We're connected to the trees, we're, we're, we're connected to the blades of grass because everything that's living that the Creator put on Earth has a spirit. Keel Marine has been making its living on the water for over 60 years and so uh, everything that we do has a focus on water and water protection, water conservation. Theodore too represented to us a unique opportunity to bring people to the water's edge and connect them to water. He really gives us the opportunity to, to leverage him as a voice so that we can draw people down to the water and express to them all of the wonderful career opportunities that exist both on land and on water within the marine industry and the importance and significance of our waterways um, and to make sure that we, we focus on keeping them swimmable, drinkable and fishable. Mohawk College is a unique educational environment that has been and continues to be a great partner to the McKeel family and the community at large. The thing that we respect the most about the college is their ability to be receptive and open to allowing the community to bring ideas into the college to engage students. And the McKeel Family Foundation has commissioned um, Chuck to build a birch bark canoe that, we, that we will share with Mohawk College. But when Theodore is out on tour, the canoe will be back on Theodore so that when we go from port to port, um, it gives us again the opportunity for the crew um, and for Theodore to share the message and the significance of people of the canoe and people of the ship working together to restore our waters. It was really important for us to support that initiative because we knew how important it was going to be, not only in connecting with the students, but beyond that, the community at large. Well, I've always been fascinated with the canoe building and the, the design of indigenous canoes. So when I heard about Theodore coming to Hamilton, I wasn't aware that much about the tugboat. 
But I said, well, if we're going to bring a ship into Hamilton Harbor, we should have a canoe with it because our ideology is a ship in the canoe representing our first treaty. I thought it would be appropriate. We got in touch with Chuck Commander, the canoe maker. He had one that was available, so it, it came on the tugboat. And then we, we put it in the water once it landed and floated it around. And then I think it was Kathy who came up with the idea, well, we should build a canoe that we can use. It's because of their uh, interest in water and our interest in getting indigenous people back on the water. So that's why we thought it would be great to reconnect uh, our students to uh, the making of a canoe. With our commitments to truth and reconciliation, uh, we've been trying to include more and more land-based learning opportunities for our students. How do we get our youth back on the land? How do we teach them things that, that just aren't accessible to most? So the opportunity to build a birch bark canoe here with our students was just a once in a lifetime opportunity. And then also being able to invite other classes. So we had international students come and visit the site. We had faculty, facilities management team. We had all kinds of people come and visit the site. Ron McCurley came and visit the site and did a couple stitches on the canoe. So it really does build community. It brings people together. It creates a space for dialogue because everybody identifies with a canoe. You could say there's nothing more symbolic of Canada than the canoe. But ironically, it was the indigenous canoe that allowed the colonizers to expand their turf, their terrain. You could almost say the canoe did us in. So by recovering our canoe and going back to its original intention, I think it'll be a way to foster reconciliation. So the very first treaty we made with the Dutch in about 1613 uh, was incorporated into this wampum belt. It was a very simple design, a white background and two purple paths that run the full length of that. And the metaphor was that the Europeans would stay in their ship, their laws, their beliefs, and, and, their, and their governance, and our laws and beliefs would stay in our canoe. But we're going to travel down this river of life uh, together. To me, it's a great metaphor for the modern era, a great uh, idea about reconciliation, that we can have two distinct vessels, two distinct cultures, governments, but they're working in parallel to each other. So this was a great opportunity for us to do a deep dive and provide a, a program that would help tell that story and, um, and forge a more meaningful connection with the students and with the college. The water is always there for us. Um, she never asks anything in return and this is the least that we can do. probably can count on one hand the ones that learned the old way. You know, even though we have uh, contemporary tools, it's still done the old, the old traditional way. Um, there's only one slight maybe variation is we don't do it on the ground anymore um, for the simple fact that uh, our knees can't take it. I have a bad knee from a hockey injury and I have no problem getting down on the ground as getting back up. And so we will build it on a platform instead now. Well, that's, that's another thing as we come to learn, it wasn't just a male thing that, it was male and female. And I had, I had read about this and then I started seeing pictures and I seen pictures of my great grandparents building a canoe together. And then all of a sudden you see the, the wife, the man and his wife, and then the kids. And so the kids were around the canoe building and they were helping out in whatever capacity they could. And then they grew up with that knowledge. And then when they met later on in life, then they both possessed that knowledge of building canoes. So it was important because that was your only way to get around. You know, if you didn't know, have that knowledge, you weren't going anywhere or you were walking. My current helper is a female and she found out that she has a Abenaki Wendat blood in her, in her uh, bloodline. And so she's like re reintroduced to the culture. And then I said, well, I got to practice what I preach. And then if you feel like it, you come with me and you learn about your culture. Think of it as an endangered art. So it's not lost, it's still there, but through programs like we're doing here, we're assuring that it's gonna continue. So we keep doing that. Of course, to become a master canoe builder takes many years. So let's just say canoe building is on the rise. It's happening all across North America. All the indigenous people are starting to rebuild 
their ancestral canoes. When I first arrived, as you can imagine, everybody's pretty quiet, kind of shy, didn't like talking, didn't quite know what to expect. But our canoe builder, uh, Chuck, is a, he's a master at bringing people together, and calming people down, and, and there's nothing there that uh, can, we can't overcome. So to see him working, to see him using his mind to resolve a problem, has been very uh, encouraging to them. So we had a talking circle at the end of our first week, and it was amazing to hear about this too. You could see the transformation in their attitude. And one thing they said that's very important, this is like we're building family. We're making a canoe, but we're building family. We've all become connected. And for the rest of their lives, they're gonna remember this experience. The beautiful thing I've learned was how my nation and Chuck's have come together and how we exchanged in the trade. I didn't know that before, how it was an Algonquin tradition. And then we would meet and trade the secrets to learn. And how the two unities of the two nations have come together and just building a simple canoe, right? And how to build it better and how they build the strength off of that. Um, I think it's just amazing to see how kind of some of your beliefs come together more than anything. You know, how Mother Nature is never to be destroyed or destructed, but you're using resources to build something so magnificent. And it was really um, eye-opening to see how everything was made of Mother Nature, right? From the nails made out of the ironwood to like, even the lashing I didn't understand. Like I thought at first, oh, it's sinew or something. Like we bought it and it was like, no, that's roots of a tree. And it was, that was really, for me, was eye-opening. I was very astonished by how everything on that is from Mother Nature. I've been able to participate in at least like every little part of the build. Um, I think my favorite was doing the stitching to bring all of the bark together. I found that very like therapeutic. I've had a hand in every little step, whether it's just like watching or like holding a piece for Chuck and yeah. So far my favorite part of this experience is the group that we have. I mean, building the canoe is just amazing and learning each step, but I think we have really fostered a great relationship and team dynamic here. And I love hearing everybody's stories because everybody's from a different nation. Um, and it's just really awesome to see how we've come together and learned each other's like learning styles and how to work on this canoe together. And just, just seeing it all come together is amazing. When I was about five years old, I uh, remember reading a book on how to build a birch bark canoe, and it's been with me ever since. And uh, it just seems uh, something I really wanted to do, and uh, I anticipated meeting a good group of people, and it's worked out. I had my hand, I think, in each part in a little way. I, uh, I'm a hands-on type of guy. And so I wanted to be a part of each without actually taking over. So I did participate, I bet you, in each element of the build so far. I am surprised how inviting it is. Uh, for everybody who comes by this build, they're all invited to participate no matter where they're from, what culture they're from, international students or otherwise. And it seems to me uh, the best way for a community to sustain and to exist. He's very like stoic in his ways and I was a little intimidated but as just the days go on he's just like such a fun person to joke around with and learn with and watching him solve problems and like little mishaps that come up during the build is just so interesting because he never he never has like a negative reaction. He just kind of accepts that, you know, a mishap is happening and just right away he's on, he starts to think and you see his thinking face and he's figuring out how to solve the issue. And he was talking about how every build, there's something new, there's a new challenge each time. So it's really cool to watch him figure that out and how to solve it. And that's why he is the master canoe builder. <laughs> The nice thing about Chuck working with Chuck is not just yeah. learning from an elder your traditional ways, but I think it's just him as a human being, how kind and passionate he is, how 
you know, his experience shines through the mistakes. You know, one of the conversations that we had privately, we said, you know, do you think we could do this without, you know, without someone like Chuck? And when you look at, as you're learning to build all the things he has to come in and teach you about, you can see why he's the master at what he does, right? It's like, oh, we broke this or we didn't tie this right. And he's very cool, calm, collective, and he comes in and he says, hey, you know what, we're going to fix it, we're going to make it better, you know, and then he rolls into like a traditional story. So it's nice to have that approach, and I think rather than a more colonial way where, you know, you'd be very criticized or structure, and for working with Chuck, it's, it's very smooth sailing through the defaults of maybe something, you know, we did, we weren't supposed to do, but he rolls with it, and that's the beauty of working with Chuck patience of a saint. I can't believe uh, he leaves us students to potentially poke holes in his canoes. <laughs> I wouldn't be that relaxed. <laughs> Let's face it, none of us, a lot of us haven't used these tools before. We don't know how hard to hit something, how much to pull something, how much to push something. Is the bark, you know, fragile, brittle? <laughs> you know, and he's letting us do everything. And, uh, you know, he's got it. He's doing this guiding hand thing, but man, all the respect in the world for the man, you know? He's doing a lot of work and he's creating a lot of experience and uh, sharing culture with a lot of different people. It's not just here, it's everywhere, where, wherever he goes. Yeah, and the thing with this is she's ready to put on. Usually what I do is I get everybody that was involved to sign this, this piece. I've been on campus experiencing the canoe build, working with Chuck Commanda and the students on board. And when I ask the students, you know, what are they getting out of this experience? And they're all saying it's, it's been just an incredible opportunity to learn from a master, to, um, to engage with one another as a community, uh, coming together to do something they know is bigger than them and very, very important. And so it was really heartfelt and really exciting to hear that kind of response. It's almost like a spiritual experience to see how this comes into play. See the indigenous knowledge at work, see the natural materials, and to see the enthusiasm of our students. We've got a great bunch of, uh, of uh, students who are working on this, and it's been very meaningful to them as well. I had promised Kathy that this canoe build, I would, uh, I would have a, a winter bark roll for a lot of people. They don't know that every year around July, August, there's a new layer that comes in, just like the growth rings in the wood of the tree. And if we can harvest that before the fireflies start, then we're able to keep it for X amount of years and then we soak it and then we build a canoe and then we can just dampen the bark again around the stencil and then take everything but the stencil away. beautiful day to launch a canoe. It was about 12 days ago when a group of uh, students and our, our, our master crafts people, myself, we, most of us met for the first time. 
and I think they all brought what we call a good mind to it. When you think about it, it's 10 days work there, but thousands of years in the making. I'd like to take a few minutes to uh, uh, thank my buddy that, uh, that passed on to the spirit world for his help in, the, uh, in helping me uh, harvest his bark. Uh, that roll of bark would have been about two years old now. And uh, he passed away about four Mondays ago. And so I, uh, I went and got the, uh, the bark uh, from his property in Bankrock. And, uh, Told him that I make a beautiful canoe with it before he passed away. And so I'm dedicating this canoe build to him, Stephen Hunter. And it's been one hell of a journey, an adventure in the last two weeks. And I'm, I'm really happy with the participants that I had. You know, they were all uh, keen, they were all ambitious, seemed to take a big interest in it. And uh, yeah, and then you couldn't ask for better. But as you can see, I uh, put it in the water. We didn't test it that last well, that one last time. And then uh, I put it in the hands of Creator, uh, you know. And uh, I was going to check it this morning, and I said, you know what? I just leave things be as they are. And when we put it on the water, there was no leaks. Nope. No. And then uh, she went well. I mean, she glided through the water, and it, it did like what uh, I. To tell people it does it. It feels like it's floating. You're floating on a leaf, you know. And when you seen when Kathy McKeel and I were on the canoe, and both of us stopped paddling for a while, the wind just tossed us around. And so that gives you an idea of how light the canoe is and how responsive it is. We have named our center. It's called Circle. It's a center for Indigenous relations, knowledge, and learning. And it's really a place where we're going to be able to make more leaps and bounds on um, infusing Indigenous knowledge into programs, to be able to do more PD with staff, to be able to do more land-based learning opportunities, um, to be able to support community members with research opportunities, and, and really beyond. Seeing that we can do this and it be a great success means that we can build on this and hopefully build this into a program so every year students can build a birch bark canoe. Every graduate that we have from Mohawk College will have graduated with some knowledge, Indigenous knowledge, Indigenous history, Indigenous relation in some way. I don't know what it is, but maybe the water is the ultimate pacifier. It, it calms you down. It removes a lot of that negativity, a lot of that fear, a lot of that doubt. And maybe that's what helps to foster a good dialogue. Restoring people's connection to the river all people's connection to the water. And in this day and age, that's a very important connection. We have to think about the future of the water. And no better way to do that than to be on a canoe surrounded by that water. Then you start being concerned about the health of that water. <laughs>